So literally just picking up where we left off on Tuesday theorem, let A be an M by N matrix. Then the orthogonal complement of the row space of A is the null space of A. And why is that? Well, I mean, this definition of a dot product that we've given might be, I mean, might seem familiar, even if you've never seen it before, because it's very closely related to our shortcut for multiplying a matrix by a vector. When we multiply a matrix by a vector and we go one times two, two times three, we're taking the dot product of that row and that column. So to be in the orthogonal complement of the row space, Let's now get rid of those details, but to be in the orthogonal complement of the row space, this stop product has to be zero. And this stop product has to be zero. And if both those dot products are zero, the result of this matrix vector multiplication is zero. So something's in the null space if and only if these two dot products are zero. That is to say, if and only if it's in the orthogonal complement of the row space. That argument, though, used a theorem, but I'm not sure I've explicitly stated. Before I do explicitly state it, let me just go back here and state a second. Mostly related theorem. The orthogonal complement of the column space is the null space of the transpose of A. And this is just because taking the transpose flips the rows and the columns. So the row space becomes the column space if you take the transpose. Going back to what I was saying a minute ago, my little argument that that is true is based on the following theorem. A vector V is in the orthogonal complement of A, if and only if V is orthogonal to a basis of A. So being in the orthogonal complement of A is telling you that you're orthogonal to an infinite number of vectors, orthogonal to every vector in A. 
And obviously you're not going to be able to check by hand that you are orthogonal to an infinite number of vectors. What this theorem is doing is saying, okay, if you can find a basis of A, you just need to check that the vector is orthogonal to those that finite set of basis vectors. If it's orthogonal to all of the vectors in the basis, it's orthogonal to all of the vectors in A. So like, um, if we let V be all the sets of the form A zero. Um, v has a basis one. Zero. If you want to look at the vector zero two and decide whether it's in the orthogonal complement of V, all we have to do is check that this vector is orthogonal to all of the vectors in the basis. And it is. So um, one times zero is zero, two times zero is zero, zero plus zero is zero. So because this vector is orthogonal to all of the vectors in this basis, it's orthogonal to all of V. Moving on. So we've talked about orthogonality kind of geometrically. Um, you should think of orthogonal vectors as being at right angles to each other. But orthogonality shows up a lot in situations where there's no, you know, geometric stuff going on. It's not just like motion in Newtonian space or whatever. And we'll later see how this notion of orthogonality can allow us to perform polynomial regression, for example. So it's a very important topic. Having said that, if we want to explain why orthogonality is such a nice property for vectors to have, the easiest way of approaching this probably is geometric. Let's say you are moving around and we are keeping track of our motion on a map. So we've got the Cartesian plane. We can think of the Cartesian plane as a map. And we've got west and east and north and south. And we can think then of the vector one zero as representing direction and distance. We can think of the vector one is zero as representing the idea of moving one mile north. And we can think of zero one as representing one mile 
east. So these vectors are giving us pieces of information that do not overlap. I mean, motion north and south and motion east and west are, well, they're orthogonal com um, concepts. And if we have a vector, say, to seven, and we write this vector in terms of this orthogonal basis, it's very easy to attach a meaning to this vector. We're going two miles north and seven miles east. So two miles north, seven miles east, assuming that the origin was our starting point, we're ending up about there. Now suppose we're trying to express this same concept, but with a non-orthogonal basis. This was a basis of R2. That's why we were definitely able to take two seven and write it as a linear combination of these vectors. We could think of, you know, the basis one, negative one, and one, one. And now this vector one, negative one, is storing the information one mile north, one mile west. And the basis one, one is storing the information one mile north, one mile east. And you see that our information is now mixed together. Our north-south information and our east-west information are now being mixed up. Both these vectors are storing north-south information. Both these vectors are storing east-west information. This is going to be harder to work with. Like, if I now sort of, if instead of giving you this, which is just two miles north, seven miles east, I give you this. It's a lot harder to look at that and get any intuitive sense of what is happening. You're going negative 2.5 miles or units in this direction, which contains both north, south, and east, west data. And then you're going 4.5 miles in this direction, which contains both north, south, and east, west data. And without actually doing the math, it's impossible to look at this and say where we're going to end up. But as a matter of fact, 
this vector and this vector are exactly the same. They're both representing the same information, but this first set of vectors was really easy to interpret. The second set of vectors was not. So speaking informally here, but if vectors are orthogonal, they do not contain overlapping pieces of information. So orthogonal vectors are easier to work with than non-orthogonal vectors, and especially orthogonal bases are easier to work with than non-orthogonal bases. Um, I guess that statement I just made requires comment. I used the phrase orthogonal basis. So far, we've just defined orthogonality in terms of two vectors being orthogonal to each other, but a set of vectors is orthogonal if all the vectors in the set are orthogonal to each other. So to determine if a set of vectors is orthogonal, you just do a bunch of dot products. And if they all end up being zero, the set's orthogonal. If any of them aren't zero, the set isn't orthogonal. As a concrete example, we could look at three, one, one. Negative one, two, one, negative one half, negative two, and I'll read my writing. I think that's supposed to be seven halves, but in any event, we can ask whether this is an orthogonal set. And to be an orthogonal set, it just means that these vectors are orthogonal. These vectors are orthogonal. And these vectors are orthogonal. So it's just a matter of doing a bunch of dot products and seeing what you get. Asking if those first three vector, two vectors are orthogonal. Well, negative three plus two plus one is indeed zero. So at least the first two vectors are orthogonal. If the first vector and the third vector are orthogonal, let's see. Um, negative three halves, negative two is negative four halves, positive seven halves. That dot product is zero. 
finally, if the second vector is orthogonal to the third vector, let's see, positive one half, negative four, which is negative eight halves, positive seven halves, sum them all up, they are indeed zero. So this is an orthogonal set. Orthogonal sets are automatically linearly independent. Um, as a proof, we can, we don't always give a proof, but this proof is pretty cute and pretty short. Let's say we have uh, orthogonal sets. Zero, the zero vector is by definition, come on, the zero vector is by definition orthogonal to anything. The zero vector dotted with any other vector is zero, but the zero vector also cannot appear in a linearly independent set, hence this little uh, adjustment I made. So say as a proof, say we have some subspace of R N and we have some orthogonal set. And we want this to be linearly independent. So let's say we have a linear combination of these vectors set equal to zero. What we want to show is that this is trivial. C1 is zero, C2 is zero, and so on up to C sub P. Well, going back to the statement I just made that the zero vector dotted with anything is zero. The real number zero is the zero vector dotted with anything. So in particular, it's the zero vector dotted with um, u sub one. Well, the zero vector is also equal to that. So it's this linear combination. Dotted with U one. So dot product distributes. So this is C one times U one dot U one. 
plus C2 times U2 dot U2 and so on down the line. Now, most of these dot products are zero, right? Because we have an orthogonal set. So in particular, U2, uh, what did I do? Typo here. So U2 dot U1 is zero. U3 dot U1 is zero. U4 dot U1 is zero. Up to, I might do all sorts of typos there. Up to UP dot U1, which is zero. So zero equals C1 times u1 dot u1. Now, u1 dot u1 is just a real number, and c1 is just a real number. And the zero product property says if we're multiplying real numbers together and getting zero, one of these numbers has to be zero itself. It was a property of dot products we put on the board on Tuesday that the dot product of a vector with itself is only zero if the vector is the zero vector. But this vector isn't the zero vector. So it can't be a u1 dot u1 that's zero. So it's c1 that's zero. If you now re repeat this process, zero equals the zero vector dotted with u2 as well, and that will give you that you would that C2 equals zero via the same argument. The zero vector equals zero dot U3. That will give us that C3 equals zero by the same argument. And you just keep repeating this argument and you find that all of those coefficients are zero. Therefore, this, this equation only has the trivial solution where everything is zero. Therefore, this set is linear the independent. Linear the independent bases are nice. I already made that observation. Um, so let's say we're in R3, for example. And we have the standard basis. So one zero 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 one zero 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 one. This is the nicest basis it's possible to have for a lot of situations. 
And one thing about it that makes it nice is that it's very easy to write any vector as a linear combination of these basis vectors without doing Gauss-Jordan elimination. One, two, three is one times the first basis vector plus two times the second basis vector minus three times the third basis vector. No real work required. If we had a different basis, it would still span R3. So we would still be able to write this vector as a linear combination of the basis vectors, but it would require Gauss-Jordan elimination to do. Like if I change, this to be one, 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 and I change this to be zero, negative seven, two, and I change this to be six, six, one, this is still a basis. I mean, these vectors are linearly independent. They, um, there are three of them in a three-dimensional space, so they are a basis. And because they are a basis, it's certainly possible to write this vector as a linear combination of these basis vectors, but it's no longer something we could do in our head. We'd go to our calculator, we'd create an augmented matrix, we'd put it in reduced row echelon form, and that's how we'd proceed. Um, a, an orthogonal basis is kind of a midway point between the best situation that we've seen and this sort of worst situation where we have to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. If you have an orthogonal basis, you can do this decomposition not as easily as you would with the standard basis, but easier than you would in this example. And let's put this on the board as a theorem. Say that we have some orthogonal basis of Maybe not even Rn. Maybe we have an orthogonal basis of a subspace of Rn. But we've got this orthogonal basis, and we've got Y belonging to this subspace. Well, because a basis is a spanning set, and it's certainly true that if we have this vector y in this space, 
we can write y as a linear combination of these basis vectors. And the special thing about an orthogonal basis is that we have an explicit form for each of these coefficients. C sub i, the ith coefficient, is the dot product of y with u sub i, the ith basis vector, divided by u sub i dot u sub i. If you're working, well, um, if you're in R3, let's say, I'm not really convinced that using this form to the and computing the um, six dot products you'd need is really going to be any faster than just plugging everything into your calculator and doing Gauss-Jordan elimination. But in terms of the box, so in terms of the number of operations that are being performed, using this formula is going to be much faster than Gauss-Jordan elimination. So like if you're working not by hand, but you're working with a calculator and you have vectors and make, or a computer, let's say, and you have vectors and matrices that are big enough that your computer is chugging and it's taking several minutes or hours to do whatever you need it to do. There is a strong incentive to see if you can make any bases you have orthogonal so that you can use this form to the instead of using Gauss-Jordan elimination. Uh, the proof of this form to the, by the way, is, is pretty much a direct corollary of something we've already done. Um, go back to here. It's a very similar argument. Instead of zero, oh, I should probably put it on its own frame. Instead of zero dot u1, we can look at y dot u1. Y is this linear combination going back to the previous frame. Once again, just like it did in that earlier proof, the dot product distributes. Then, just as happened in the previous proof, 
because this is an orthogonal basis, these dot products are all zero except for one. U1 is not the zero vector. I didn't write that down explicitly, but a basis cannot include the zero vector because any set containing the zero vector is dependent. So because U1 isn't the zero vector, This stop product is not to zero. And we can divide by it. And we get C1 equals Y dot U1 divided by U1 dot U1 exactly what I claimed we'd get on this frame. If you, instead of using U1 here, if you used U2, you'd have gotten C2 equals, and then you just repeat that process and you'd solve for all of the C's. So a lot of these uh, a lot of these are just, um, examples end up being a little tedious, just doing all of the dot products and stuff. But let's say what are we at with time? We have 30 minutes. I don't want to do an example of this. I am going to trust that you can use this formula, but if you do have questions on the homework and or find that it's not working out, just give me a yo and I'll help you with it. But what I'd really like to do before the class ends is get to orthogonal projection. Before I do, one stray definition. An orthonormal set. Is orthogonal and all the norms of the vectors are one. I I've never been a fan of this uh, naming convention because I mean, ordinarily normal means that things are at a right angle, right? So it's kind of confusing that we've got orthogonal, which means that they're at a right angle and normal, which would usually mean they're at a right angle, but here is referring to the norm, which means the length and means something completely different. But whether I like it or not, the terminology is what it is. Let's talk, for heaven's sake, about orthogonal projections. The idea behind this is easy enough. 
And you can think of it in terms of real world physics very easily. Let's say that we have a horizontal plane. And we've got an object on the plane, and we are dragging this object from left to right. And the way we're dragging the object from left to right is that we have a rope attached to it, and then we have the rope over our shoulder. So the force we are exerting on the object is going in that direction, the direction the rope is being pulled. Well, some of the force that we are exerting on this object is being wasted because we're trying to pull the object horizontally. We're not trying to lift the object, and yet we have vertical force here. In particular, force is additive, so we've got that vertical force and that horizontal force. And the horizontal force is all that we're interested in. This is the idea in a nutshell behind orthogonal projections. You have a vector, maybe not a horizontal vector, but referring back to this example, the vector in question would be the ground. And we have some other vector. And we want to create a right triangle like this. So that this vector here, this vector here, is the sum of this vector. And this vector. If we can accomplish that, we have performed an orthogonal projection. And it's always possible to accomplish this. I said if but there's actually no doubt. We could state this as a theorem. If U and V are, let's, let's make sure that I am using the same notation that's in my notes and also in the textbook. If U and Y are vectors, it is possible to write Y possible to write y equals y hat dot c, where y hat equals alpha times u and z is orthogonal. You. 
And this is just the situation that we were talking about. Let's say, that we have a vector u and a vector y. Then we can create a right triangle. We can call this vector z. Race, a race. Such that this vector z is orthogonal to you. Well, we see that Z and U are at right angles with each other. And this vector here is what we called Y hat. And y hat is a scalar multiple of u. Y hat is going in the same direction as u. It looks like maybe y hat is about a third of u in this picture. So this picture is doing exactly what that theorem says we should be able to do. And that is an orthogonal projection. And we have an explicit form for this. This scalar alpha. Is y dot u divided by u dot u? Um, where does this value of alpha come from? I mean, it's something we can compute directly. Say that we've done this decomposition. So y equals y hat plus z, where y hat equals alpha u and z is orthogonal to you. Well, then y minus y hat equals z. Yes. But y hat equals alpha u. So let's also rewrite this as y minus alpha u equals C. Now, Z dot U equals zero. That's the statement here that Z is orthogonal to U. We can rewrite that statement in light of the fact that z is y minus alpha u.
this dot product distributes over subtraction. And now we just solve for this thing, for this alpha, as if, as if we were, you know, in a cottage algebra class. Bring it over to the right. We can divide by u dot u. We are assuming here that u is not the zero vector y dot u divided by u dot u was alpha. So that's where that comes from, that, uh, that equation. In this picture, or this diagram. Let's see. Ah. Why hat is called the orthogonal projection? of y on to u. Um, the idea of projection comes from the idea that if you had like a projector, a film projector sitting back here, and this y hat for a physical object, this film projector would cast the y hat onto it would, would cast y, sorry, onto the wall as a shadow, and the projection on the wall would be this y hat. And as for as for z. Yeah. It's the orthogonal component. Or I guess I say orthogonal component. The textbook says it's the component orthogonal probably not worth picking a fight over. So let's use the textbook's uh, terminology, the component of y orthogonal uh, And the orthogonal projection is really important. As I say, it's sort of when we see it, it looks like, okay, this is something that exists for physics, but not like biology or other fields. That's not true at all. We're going to see, as I say, that this has major applications to basically everything. I've already given an application, which is that polynomial regression is going to be based on this. For now, though, that should be the end of this section. Does anybody have questions? And I We'll see you next week uh, in class right before Thanksgiving break.